It's been less than a year since Joe Biden took office and already the U.S. economy is faltering on several fronts. High inflation is eating into American savings while a supply bottleneck is keeping store shelves empty just in time for the holidays. In this special edition of Hold the Line, we'll take a look at the causes and impact of America's current economic freefall. Welcome to this special edition of Hold the Line. I'm Buck Sexton. Economy's got problems, folks. You know it, you see it, you feel it. You're paying for it. Biden administration has a bunch of collectivists, know-nothings in key policy positions, or just people who don't know anything about anything, period. They're making poor decisions. They're focused on things like equity and social justice and taxing the rich instead of how do we have the most prosperous, resilient, and robust American economy possible. That's not their primary goal. They have ideological reasons for focusing in on other things. And here's what's happened. Enough of the American people have figured out what's really going on here that the polls are showing the Biden administration's got a problem on its hands. And so what are they going to do? Are they going to take this moment to say, hold on, maybe we should think long and hard about some of our economic policies. Maybe we should change things up, adjust so that we're doing the right things instead of what they've been doing. No, no, of course not. What they decide is to double down on the usual propaganda. The talking points start getting spewed by Saki Bomb over at the White House. For example, if you're annoyed about the economy, specifically about the supply chain crisis aspect of what we're seeing right now, it's Americans' fault. Watch. Well, I think our message is uh, that, one, what's happening right now, uh, and I wish I had the chart, but we'll give it to all of you afterwards, is that uh, so many people across the country are purchasing more goods online. Maybe some of it is from habits that developed during the pandemic when people weren't leaving their homes. Some of it is because we've seen an economic recovery that has been underway for the last nine months where five million more people are working. The unemployment rate has been cut in half. And that is leading to a massive increase in volume. That's what's happening at ports. But what we would tell people is we are addressing and attacking the supply chain issues, even with the increased volume, which is the root cause here. I mean, sure. Yeah, they, they know what they're doing. You can trust Jen Psaki. Did she take Econ 101? Honestly, though, think about it for a second. Did she? Here's a Washington Post headline as well. Don't rant about short staff stores and supply chain woes. Try to lower expectations. And that's really the definition of this moment in time. That's really the slogan. If the Biden administration had to settle on one for the economy, it's lower your expectations. Stop whining about how crappy we are at creating economic conditions of prosperity in this country, allowing the business of the American people to be business. No, no, no. Sure, we're getting in the way. We're not, we're not following through on things we said we would, but... That's what Democrats always do. So really, should we, should we be surprised in the least? I mean, here's White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain retweeting a tweet that inflation and supply chain issues are a high-class problem. You'll, you'll notice what's going on here. The people, in charge, uh, and the people in charge are trying to find ways to blame the people that are upset about the governance that we're seeing, specifically with regard to the economy. Klain, the tweet here, by the way, was most of the economic problems we're facing, inflation, supply chains are a high-class problem. We wouldn't have them if the unemployment rate was still 10%. We would still have a much, much worse problem. Okay, yeah, we could all be starving to death, so I guess we're not allowed to complain about supply chain. Like, is that really where we are? Is, is that supposed to be a serious argument? Ah, but see, that's where the issue is. The Biden administration is full of highly unserious people. They're not people you should be listening to. These are not people that actually know what the heck they're talking about, but they're in charge. They got a lot of power right now. So supply chain... Shut up, expect less, it's your fault. That's pretty much what the Biden administration's got for you. What about on inflation? It's another area where we got a big problem here. You got the biggest inflation increase this year we've seen in decades. But hold on, I remember we were being told just a few months ago that it was gonna be, remember this word? Transitory. I will say, as we've said in here before, but we'll reiterate that, of course, we take uh, the possibility of inflation quite seriously uh, as you know, actions that have been taken to date or proposals that have been made. Uh, most economic analysts have believed that it will have a temporary or transitory impact. Ah, I mean, I guess all economic impacts are transitory, right? In a sense, it always has to change at some point. Nothing is really forever, even currency, even America, right? Nothing's really forever, is it? So... That's one philosophical way to approach this, but inflation is not transitory. If that means going away quickly and not going to be a problem for you, it's going to get worse. It has been getting worse since she said that. We've all seen that is the reality. 
And I think we're also all quite aware of the fact that Jan Psaki is going to have to continue to somehow carry water for people in this administration who don't know what the heck they're doing. So get ready for the talking points to be flying fast and furious at all of us. Um, also, they're going to make inflation worse. It's pretty straightforward, actually. When you put a lot more money in the economy, when you spend a lot more money as a government, when you decide you're going to add to the U.S. debt by trillions of dollars, uh, that's going to exacerbate, exacerbate inflation. I mean, here's Biden, for example, telling you the opposite of that, which I'm just going to say is crazy town, but I mean, it's crazy old Sleepy Joe. He doesn't, by the way, 101 econ, you think Joe Biden passed it either? You think he remembers anything? This is not a guy you would want to be running your lemonade stand with your kids. Joe Biden would probably be unable to make change properly. Yet here he is, leader of the free world, such as it is, and he's telling everybody, oh no, spending an additional $3.5 trillion of taxpayer money is going to end inflation and bad weather. My Republican friends talk a lot about inflation. But if you want to talk about actually lowering the cost of living for people in this country, my plan does just that. By strengthening the capacity of our economy, while also reduce inflationary pressures over the long run. Here's something else my plan does. It confronts the crisis of extreme weather events that we're seeing all around us and around the world, but just here in America. We see it everywhere. We know it's real. What? No, no, no. But they say so much crazy stuff, right? It's hard to keep track of all of it. We're trying to focus on the economy. Jobs, GDP, growth, entrepreneurship, Americans having greater buying power, more money in their pockets, cheap gas, products available. These are things we actually want. What is the Secretary of Transportation, who of course was on parental leave while the supply chain crisis kept getting worse and worse, he's gone for two months, what did he say we need? Well, here you go. Here's what he thinks we need. The president's Build Back Better agenda as a whole will ease some of that inflationary pressure. One of the reasons why we sometimes struggle to keep up with demand when demand is good uh, is that uh, you got a lot of forces that keep Americans out of the workforce, not least the struggle to get good child care uh, so, uh, or, or the struggle to, to get good affordable child care, I should say. Uh, so when you talk about some of the pro-family policies in the Build Back Better agenda, those stand to actually ease inflationary pressure. And again, these immediate issues around the pandemic, which is why, honestly, the best way to smooth all of this out remains getting everybody vaccinated and putting that pandemic in the rearview mirror. Child care, vaccines, do what we say, listen to Fauci, that'll make the economy better. These, they, they, honestly, they have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to all this other authoritarian nonsense, sure, that, that's exactly what they want to do. So what's really happening with the Biden economy? Why does it suck? We'll explain. We've got a great lineup of guests tonight to share their expertise in the current economic crisis. Coming up, we have Trish Regan. She's going to stop by to give her thoughts on rising gas prices and not so transitory inflation. So stay right there. If you've been to the grocery store or filled up your gas tank over the past few months, you've most likely noticed that sticker prices have jumped considerably. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, annual inflation rose at its fastest pace in more than 30 years during September. If you're expecting relief anytime soon, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says, don't hold your breath. This rising inflation is hitting Americans while it's hard, impacting everything from gas prices to groceries. When do you expect the inflation to get back to the, you know, 2% range, which is considered normal 2022 when well i expect that to happen next year on a 12-month basis the inflation rate um, will remain high uh, into next year because of what's already happened but uh, i expect improvement uh, by the end of by the middle to end of next year so that pain at the pump you can expect that to continue for the foreseeable future here to give her perspective on the rising inflation rate is the host of the Trish Regan Show podcast, Trish Regan. Trish, good to see you. Good to see you, Buck. So where do we go here with inflation? How bad does it get? What happens? 
Well, it's bad. It's bad already. It's going to continue to get worse. I mean, we've seen the price of turkey. It's going to be up 27 percent this Thanksgiving. Um, look, it, it's it's a reality now, and it's unfortunately um, all self-made. I mean, look, you cannot give out that much money by way of stimulus checks. You cannot print that much money by way of quantitative easing and the Federal Reserve and not expect to have some consequences. So yes, prices are going up. The thing that's a problem, Buck, and what people need to remember is this is really bad for everyday Americans because it's not like wages are going up simultaneously at the same amount. Wages are maybe going up like a percent, but when you've got prices going up 6% on average, this means people are in the hole. And they're going to continue to be. And it's a complete result of our own, frankly, uh, very, very poor policy. Grocery prices, you mentioned Turkey, which is obviously near and dear to a lot of people's hearts because of what's coming up here in a few weeks with Thanksgiving. But beef and veal, 17.6%. Pork, 12.7%. Eggs, 12.6%. People can really see. I mean, we're talking about beef, by the way, up 17%. That hurts. People see that, right? A lot of folks buying hamburgers for the... For the family, for the kids, they see that increase on the bill at the grocery store. They say, ouch, what is this other than just exactly what people have been saying is going to happen, Trish, from spending too much money from the government? Look, I mean, it's just bad policy. And the more you creep towards this socialism nonsense, the more you try and just hand out free money by way of both the administration and the Federal Reserve, the more you're going to have this problem. I mean, it, it's not rocket science here. It, it's very obvious and should be obvious. But, you know, frankly, here's the problem, Buck. People in Washington, they don't care because it sounds good if they can, say, give a 5.9% increase in Social Security benefits, despite the fact that, of course, prices are going up for everything. So those people living on a fixed income, they, they need that increase. This is not something to be proud of. But the administration, they have this idea, the Biden team does, that somehow prices going up are good. It's not good. It acts as a tax on everyday consumers. And Americans are figuring this out over and over and over again. Look, economic issues very much at play right now. Cultural issues very much at play right now. The administration has done a very poor job. It's all their own doing. Trish, Janet Yellen, we would think, knows how all this works, right? Treasury Secretary understands all of it. Is she able, even you think, because of the position she's in to speak honestly about what's going on? Because she seems to constantly tell everybody, oh, it's, you know, it's not gonna be that bad. It's not gonna last. It's not gonna get that high. The inflation's not going to really bite the way that some are saying. She seems to be wrong a fair amount. Is she wrong because she really doesn't see where this is going? Or is it because she works the Biden administration and she can't really tell the truth? You know, I'm really disappointed in Janet Yellen. I covered her appointment. It was a big deal. First female head of the, the Federal Reserve, very, very big deal. And you know, I always thought she did a wonderful job at measuring any kind of political opinion that she might have had. I did have a little bit of a nickname for her in that she kind of reminded me at the time of, of the fairy godmother, you know, in Cinderella, <laughs> the old Disney version, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. And she had that sort of magic wand that she would throw towards the market, which was much needed during the Obama years because we didn't have enough in the way of real concrete, good, strong economic policy. So she'd wave her magic wand and the market would go up. So investors really loved her. In some ways, loved her so much, I thought she might have been better under Trump than even Jerome Powell because she was more willing to just print money. And hey, what president doesn't like someone? who's going to print money, unless, of course, they print so much that you're dealing with mass inflation, which we are now. But anyway, Janet Yellen has had a history of being very measured in her chatter. And I'm like, whoa, who is this person? Who is this woman now suddenly who speaks in such really strong political tones? It's like she's thrown all sort of sensibility, which I think you need as an economist, right out the window, Buck. And she's become a real political animal. Maybe she was all along. We just never saw that before. So personally, I'm highly, highly disappointed in her. And she's become, I'm sorry to say it, a political hack. Trish, people looking at the Biden economy also see what's going on with gas prices. And they are understandably not happy. Today, gas price uh, at the national average was $3.40 a gallon. Last month, three nineteen. dollars Last year, $2.12. For people who are watching their spending and who have to live on a budget, this hurts. Why is it happening? 
it's happening in part because of the administration's oil policies, right? When you say we hate oil and you broadcast that to the world, you make it very clear to oil investors, why should I invest? You know, you combine that with this ESG nonsense that they're filtering every investment through. Nobody wants to go near oil companies. So what happens? Oil companies don't actually invest in the infrastructure because they don't have the investment from investors because nobody wants to go near the stuff. It's politically untouchable. Consequently, oil prices go up. I mean, what, what's amazing to me is the naivete of this administration. Look, you can be pro green energy and still pro oil with the understanding that you may have the aspiration of going totally green someday, but in the interim period, you're still going to need oil. So you gotta figure it out along the way so you don't actually do what you're doing to people, which is completely take a chunk right out of their earnings thanks to higher gas prices. We are going to have higher gas prices, higher natural gas prices. This is the reality of the future, Buck, and it's entirely attributable to what the administration has done in terms of talking to you know investors and having them shun oil. This is the result. Trish, you know, we just had the uh, recent election in Virginia. Glenn Youngkin comes out on top over Terry McAuliffe. Democrats are running scared right now, it seems, wondering what's going to happen in the midterm elections already just a year out from now. And that brings into focus for a moment the massive spending bill that is still, some are saying that's why we've had, the Democrats had the, the losses that they did in Virginia because Congress hadn't passed this thing. Joe Manchin's position seems to have been strengthened by the recent electoral results. Same thing with Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, Manchin of West Virginia. So what do you think happens here? Because you got all these economic issues we're talking about, high gas prices, inflation, a lot of unfilled jobs in the country as well, GDP slowing down, considerably in the most recent quarter, I think it's 2%, right? Which was way below what it was supposed to be. So what do you see happening with that spending bill? Does it still go forward? Does Manchin say this is too crazy? How does that play out? I don't think the spending bill goes forward. I think you might actually, and you know, this is on the Democrats right now, it's on the most extremists in the Democrat party to actually pass a clean infrastructure bill. In other words, you can get your head around bridges and roads and improvement at airports but can you really get your head around housing for the elderly you know pre-k for every student nursery school for every student daycare paid time off i mean look all wonderful projects don't get me wrong buck i mean lovely wonderful things to do and you know it, the altruistic side of all of us wants to help people as much as humanly possible, but there's a limit in terms of what the federal government can do. And what they're asking in the federal government, frankly, is far too much and basically totally unaffordable. We don't have this money. So I have a feeling that this is gonna continue to meet challenges. Whether or not they're able to get the infrastructure bill through, well, you know what, that's on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and the rest of them right now. If they actually want an improvement for bridges and roads, I mean, you know, it's it's a bird in the hand, so to speak. They ought to take what they can get and be thankful for that and move on. As for the big social projects, I'm sorry we can't afford it. It's not gonna happen right now. And you combine what's happening economically in this country, along with the cultural concerns and sort of the, you know, it, Virginia was just a great example, I think, of Americans saying, wait a second, you know what, this is our country. Party doesn't matter as much as just our own identity, the sense of individuals, the sense that parents have control over their kids' education. All of these things are coming into play. And people are saying to themselves, this isn't working out the way we thought it was going to. And that's an important lesson. Look, elections have consequences. We are dealing with the consequences of the left in charge right now, but I bet you it's not for long. Trish, great to see you. Thanks for the expertise. Good to see you too, Buck. The past several months have been disappointing when it comes to jobs reports as Americans are failing to return to the workforce. Coming up, we'll talk to the former Director of Trade and Manufacturing Policy under President Trump, Peter Navarro, about the Biden administration's inability to get America back to work. Yes, there's, you know, there's a lot more to be done. We still have to tackle the costs that American families are facing. But this recovery is faster, stronger, and fairer and wider than almost anyone could have predicted. Biden uh, declaring victory after receiving a rare piece of positive news about the economy. According to the Department of Labor, U.S. economy added 531,000 jobs in the month of October. 
which did surpass economists' expectations, but economists, as we know, are pretty much wrong all the time. Despite the good news, the economy remains more than 4 million jobs short of its pre-pandemic levels, and growth, contrary to Biden's claims, continues to be sluggish. The American economy expanded by only 2% in the third quarter this year, well below market forecasts, and slowing sharply from 6.7% in the second quarter. We now is a former assistant to President Trump, director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy, and author of the newly released book, In Trump Time, My Journal of America's Play Gear, Peter Navarro. Peter, thanks for being here. Hey, Buck. Uh, yeah, in Trump time means a uh, good term I coined in as quickly as possible. And, and Biden seems to be destroying the economy in Trump time, kind of ironic, as it were. Uh, this this guy has no clue uh, about how to generate economic growth, rising wages and secure supply chains. Uh, it's it's some trouble we've got right now, Buck. So I want to I want to get back into your book in a second here. But first, I want to drill down on on the the uh, unemployment number it obviously just came out. 4.6% is the unemployment rate they're telling us, but the labor force participation rate remains low, about 61.5%. Why is that happening? Why is the participation number <clears throat> continuing to lag here? Why aren't people coming back into the new job market or into the job market? So I, I'm so glad you mentioned that, but because the labor force participation rate was like an obsession of mine during when I was in the Trump administration as the president's economic advisor. Prior in the Obama-Biden years, we saw a steady fall in that labor force participation rate as people left the workforce, became discouraged workers, and then they would no longer be accounted in the unemployment rate. So, so it gave you like an artificial read. People left the workforce during Obama-Biden, they were discouraged because the jobs were, were going away. One of the great achievements of, of Trump uh, in the Trump economy was to bring that back up, but now it's falling down, back down. And you ask why, it, it, there's a complex set of reasons. A lot of it are pandemic related. Um, you start with what I call the service sector refugees. We've had, uh, this is like the Wuhan lab here where Fauci and the Chinese communists cooked up the virus that hit like a neutron bomb of our major cities. Think about it, Buck. You hit the three major pillars of a city with this virus. You, you got the, the mass transit, the entertainment districts, and the high-rise commercial office buildings. What do we have now? It's like all these white-collar folks. Yeah, they're, they're, they're cool out in Connecticut. They're out in the burbs. They're commuting with their laptops, no problem. But what about the janitors? What about the service workers? What about the, the food trucks? The, ta everybody, the urban ecosystem, those folks um, have now been unemployed for a very long time. Uh, they're dropping out of the workforce. That labor force participation uh, rate is going down. Uh, policy also drove, drove it surprisingly, where uh, they they came up with a with a bright idea to give unemployment benefits, one size fits all, no matter the cost of living across the 50 states. A lot of people have been staying home because they've been getting getting welfare checks, government paychecks, unemployment concentration, higher than what they would earn at work uh, and have to face the risk of the virus. A lot of things going on. Uh, the universal vaccination policy, Buck, is now coming into play because uh, whether you support that or not, as a, as a practical economic matter, a significant fraction of pilots, food processors, truckers, not to mention police, fire, nurses, Navy SEALs, are choosing to leave work rather than submit themselves to what is effectively an experimental vaccine. And I'm not anti-vax. I was one of the guys that helped get that vaccine to market. I'm just saying that there's just a lot of labor market distortions, shortages going on, even as there's 10 million, almost 10 million people unemployed and a lot of people dropping out of the workforce. Peter, you were a senior advisor to President Trump on trade, among, among other matters. Obviously, supply chain plays a pretty big role in all that. We've all been seeing in recent weeks the footage of these uh, shipping container uh, yeah. ships out there uh, that are just snarled up and we can't get the truckers to actually transport the stuff fast enough. What's causing this and how could the Biden administration effectively address it? The uh, the central um, organizing principle of the Trump economic strategy was buy American, hire American. We understood that if your factories are here, 
your supply chains were here will be here. You'll not only have economic prosperity and rising wages, you'll have resilient supply chains. When you when you send them offshore to the sweatshops of Asia, you have what or what become very fragile supply chains, even in the best of circumstances, you have a tsunami in Japan or whatever can disrupt that. In a pandemic, what you have are broken supply chains. And, and the In Trump Time book spends a lot of time talking about the Buy American, Hire American agenda, particularly within the context of the pandemic itself, where I myself spent a tremendous amount of time trying to bring home production for our PPE, our masks, our gov- goggles, and all of that. Bottom line, but as long as we continue to offshore our jobs, uh, we will have these kinds of problems even in the best of times. But right now, those supply chains are broken. And, and you know what? If, if you can't get a chip, for a computer chip from communist China into an auto factory in Detroit, what that does is it not only slows down production line and, and the economic growth, it actually drives up the effective cost of wages and creates inflation. Workers don't earn anymore, but their productivity goes down. And so it's it's just very complex. And and it's so complex that I think Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, kind of went home because he couldn't handle that, or maybe for some other reason. But leaving his post for two months in the middle of (laughs) the worst supply chain crisis we've ever faced. Yeah, he thinks he's a hero, of course, but we'll talk about that some other time. Peter, you got a book out right now in Trump time. He told us that's just means like on the double, right? Trump time means get it done as fast as humanly possible. My Journal of America's Plague Year. Tell us a little bit about what's what's in the book. Watch people pick it up. What are they going to find out? Well, I start uh, I start with uh, uh, my first encounter with Tony Fauci, and and this is a man. One of the missions of the book is to move Fauci out of government into a jail cell. And if you look at here, this is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and the question is, yeah, what did he know when he knew it? Like Fauci knew as early as January 2020, at the dawn of the pandemic, that the virus came from Wuhan. Right? It popped up within yards of this. What he what he knew but didn't tell us was that he actually was funding this lab. He had lifted the ban on these gain of function experiments, which can turn a harmless bat virus into a human killer. And he authorized that kind of research. And he was told flat out that uh, this virus was genetically engineered in all likelihood. Uh, part of the, 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 the book like, points out what is, Buck, it's the biggest lie of omission ever in government. If he, had, if Fauci had simply told us all of that at the dawn of the pandemic, we would have, we would have had a much different strategy. There would be hundreds of thousands of Americans alive today that are not. We would have, we would have put much more pressure on the Chinese to to dish on the original genome. We would have got a a better, faster vaccine, and we would have not lost the time we did. So that that's a big part of holding China communist China responsible for its attack on America is another part of the book. And at the end, uh, a lot of it talks about getting to the truth of, of the November uh, 3rd election and uh, the, the um, January 6th uh, chaos on Capitol Hill, where, by the way, Pence betrayed Trump. And uh, there's a big reveal there as to why he did it. And uh, it's a story that hasn't been told before. Peter, people should pick up the book. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good to talk, Buck. Over 100 container ships are loitering off the coast of Southern California, waiting to unload billions of dollars worth of goods on the U.S. shores. The bottleneck is wreaking havoc on the American economy, an issue that's unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. When we come back, economist Peter St. Ange will stop by to discuss the supply chain crisis in detail and what it means for your bottom line. It was, it was crystal clear that things were not improving on supply chain. People couldn't get dishwashers and, and furniture and treadmills delivered on time, not to mention all sorts of other things. So why the is it... The tragedy of the, short, the treadmill that's delayed. Right, the, tra- the tragedy of the treadmill that's delayed. Jen Psaki might be having a laugh over the current supply chain collapse, but American families don't have that luxury. For people around the country, the bottleneck at U.S. ports means empty store shelves and rising prices for basic necessities and right in time for the holidays. 
For their part, the White House seems to be blaming everyone else for the crisis. Here's what Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg had to say just yesterday. Well, we are going to continue to see challenges. The steps that we're taking are making a difference. But uh, think about all of the things that have to happen to get a product to a shelf uh, on time. Uh, fundamentally, it's up to the producers, the shippers, and the retailers. And we're doing everything we can to help them move those goods across uh, infrastructure that's often outdated. Look, we've got demand that's off the charts. The Retail Federation is predicting an all-time record high in terms of sales. We've got supply, which is, uh, in some cases, actually up but not up uh, enough to keep up with that demand. And then uh, the biggest thing of all, of course, you have the pandemic. <clears throat> the pandemic is poking holes in supply, no matter how good any company or any administration is. My next guest argues that policy, not COVID, is responsible for the supply chain issues. Joining me now is research fellow at the Heritage Foundation and economist Peter St. Ange. Peter, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Buck. All right, so the Biden White House and the people in his cabinet are blaming COVID, blaming Trump, Amazon, you name it. What's really gumming up the works? Why do we have these big supply chain issues? That has been the pattern, scapegoat everything uh, for the problems they caused. Uh, fundamentally, there are really three things that are driving this, right? One of them is regulations that make it hard to work particularly labor and environmental regulations. Number two is paying millions of people not to work, which specifically hit the kind of people who normally work in supply chains. Uh, and then number three is just union monopoly control over really the most important infrastructure in our supply chains. So what can be done on these issues? I mean, give, give me a sense of how the Biden administration, actually before we get into what they should do, have they addressed some of these issues? Have they exacerbated these issues, uh, these issues so far? They've really uh, been exacerbating them with their new plans. Uh, so, you know, they've got these trillion dollar spending bills, uh, a lot of social engineering programs that introduce new labor regulations, new environmental regulations. Uh, the activists really, they have an endless appetite to find new things to ban. They've specifically trained their sites on trucking emissions and actually ship emissions. So it's sort of the next stage of the environmental revolution here is to specifically target the most critical pieces of our supply chains. So really everything they've been doing has been so far making it worse. Uh, if they keep up with these new bills that they have in the pipeline, then it could get substantially worse. Uh, you know, Wall Street is warning this could continue into 2022, even 2023. People are worried about Christmas, but actually beyond that, we're seeing shortages on store shelves across the country, right? Basic goods, you're looking at uh, meats, breads, uh, dairy, right? We're seeing rising prices. So things are getting worse. They are not getting better. Uh, this is not about COVID. There's not some record of imports. This is uh, just par for the course for the past 18 months. Uh, you know, blame COVID whenever you're out of ideas. Uh, and what they've proposed so far, if anything, is likely to make it worse. So what role does in China also comes up in this and the offshoring of a lot of U.S. production capacity some are even saying, look, guys, this is a wake up call for us, irrespective of what bad decisions have been made by the Biden administration, that we need energy independence, but we also need greater supply chain capacity, at least on the U.S. side for essential goods. Right. You're talking about things like the bread and the food. And, you know, yeah, we get all of our uh, all of our chips, basically, from Taiwan. We get a lot of our medicine from China, a lot of antibiotics, things people don't realize actually comes from over there. So how does that play into all this? Right, and that's really kind of the issue is that across our entire supply chain, we depend on components that come in. So for example, if you take food, resins, which is kind of plastic, you need those in order to even transport food that we make here in this country. So really we, throughout pretty much everything we produce and everything that people buy depends on these foreign sources. And a lot of that has been Again, government mandates, government taxes, regulations that have chased manufacturing out of this country. And so we end up relying on these other countries. And when a crisis hits, uh, that ends up shooting us in the foot. So this current situation seems like it's likely to get worse. 
What is the Biden, uh, the Biden White House doing about it? And what would you advise them to do about it? What they're doing so far is, you know, you played clips earlier, either ridiculing customers. Uh, there was a uh, lower your expectations has been the tone. Uh, they've actually been attacking the people trying to fix supply chains. So going after shippers, going after meat packers. Uh, what they really need to do is to stand up to activists and stand up to unions. Uh, you know, Trump, he sat down with people actually doing the work and he said, what do you guys need? What kind of rules are in the way? How can the federal government help you, right? So instead of attacking people, he should take a page from that, sit down and ask these people, what kinds of regulations do we need to get rid of, either temporarily or permanent? <laughs> Unfortunately, he has not shown an interest in standing up to either activists or unions. So it's likely it needs to get a lot worse, I think, before he's gonna take action. Peter, thanks for being with us, appreciate it. Thank you, Buck. The Biden administration's solution to the current economic turmoil can be summed up in two words, tax and spend. After the break, we'll talk to former Trump economic advisor, Stephen Moore about the White House's multi-trillion dollar Build Back Better plan and how it may exacerbate the crisis. Stay with us. As we've demonstrated thus far, the U.S. economy is currently stalling on almost every front, from unemployment to inflation and a supply chain bottleneck that's likely to drag on into 2022. So just what's the White House's plan to address these issues? Enter President Biden's signature legislation, the so-called Build Back Better plan, which can be summarized by two words, tax and spend. The bill is a grab bag of progressive agenda items that, as of right now, have a price tag of around $1.75 trillion. Here to explain the potential impact of the Build Back Better bill is former Trump economic advisor and co-founder of the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. That sounds like a good idea these days. Steve Moore. Steve, good to see you. Good to see you. And by the way, please don't use that one point seven five trillion dollar number because you know these are all phony baloney numbers. They're yeah. Just can, can you break up. that down? What, what's the real number, and why is it the real number, Steve? Tell everybody. Well, we don't know what the real number is. I suspect it's well over three trillion dollars. They're they're just uh, you know making up uh, using phony accounting by saying, oh well, we're only going to fund this bill for you know three or four years, not the full ten years. And even on the revenue side, they for example they say they're going to get hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of, of revenue to pay for this by hiring more IRS agents. I mean, come on, is that really going to create hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue? Probably not. So my point is they are just lying about the numbers. As the Wall Street Journal said last week, it's just, uh, it's just fake uh, bookkeeping. So um, I think people should just be aware of that, that, that it's made up numbers. So Steve, they keep saying this legislation is not going to impact most Americans in terms of taxes. Here's what Joe Biden had to say about it recently. That's why the Build Back Better framework will have a 15 percent minimum on the largest corporations, a minimum tax of 15 percent. The top one percent of the wealthiest Americans evade, it's estimated by the experts, $160 billion a year in federal taxes. That's wrong. We're going to change that. I want to emphasize what I said from the beginning. Under my plans, if you earn less than $400,000, you won't pay a single penny more in federal taxes, period. In fact, these bills continue cutting taxes for middle class, for child care, for health care, so much more. I mean, Steve, first, is that accurate? I mean, should we really believe that nobody making less than $400,000 a year is going to pay more in federal taxes? And then, of course, there are other questions like, well, they're going to pay more in other places. But what, what do you make of it? Well, let's see. Do you make four hundred thousand uh, dollars? Not quite, right? Please, <laughs> yeah, go I wasn't expecting okay. that one, but go ahead. <laughs> but look, here's the point. You know, uh, anybody who buys gasoline, anybody who goes to the grocery store, uh, anyone who uh, is going to subject to this methane tax, which obviously is just going to be passed on to American consumers, everybody's going to pay. We're already paying. You know, when you ask me. Will middle class people pay for this? They already are. We're already paying a dollar a gallon gasoline, uh, essentially a tax because of Biden's energy policies. So, yeah, everybody's going to pay the cost of this, even if they were able to get that money out of corporations. And by the way, I, I kind of I do think every corporation should 
should pay, you know, I don't, I agree with them. I don't think there should be major corporations that don't pay any tax, but that's because Joe Biden and his colleagues built in all these. Can, can we dive in on that for a second? Because it does seem like they keep playing this game where they say, we're going to raise the corporate tax for everybody because there are some companies that are able to not pay any tax. Why don't they just get rid of these some companies that not pay any corporate tax, right? I mean, the Trump tax rate got dropped, uh, Trump tax rate got dropped down. Why not just make sure that all corporations pay that rate if that's what they want to do? Well, that's exactly the point. You're right. And so let's get rid of the loopholes. You know, I've always been a flat tax guy. Let's have an 18 percent flat tax and every company and every individual has to pay that tax. And there's no loopholes. There's no it doesn't matter how many lobbyists you have. Incidentally, do you really does anybody out there really believe that they're going to get more tax revenues out of Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Oprah Winfrey? They're, they're not stupid. They're going to they have lobbyists, they have lawyers, they have accountants that are going to find ways of, uh, that that tax is going to affect all of us. That's why when they say, oh, don't worry, this new tax only affects the top 1%. That's what they've been saying. That's the lie they've been saying for 100 years when they invented the income tax. You may not know this because you weren't born back then, but I was 100 years ago. But they, you know, they, the line was, don't worry, folks, this is just about the millionaires and billionaires. And then, of course, pretty soon everybody was paying income tax. Uh, it, it's, it's just the lie that uh, hopefully Americans won't, won't fall for again. Another common talking point is that this legislation is somehow going to pay for itself. I mean, here's what Jen Psaki had to say back in October. I still believe that Build Back Better will not add a dime to the national debt. Correct, it won't. Why, would he, why, why should Americans believe that? Because it won't. Go ahead. What if taxes that he says he wants to you know, get more taxes in? What if it doesn't happen? What if the economy goes sour? Lots of things can happen. Mm-hmm. What are you, you're going to tell from up there future generations, not even born yet, that they're not on the hook for this. Is that right? That's right. And hopefully you'll report accurate information yourself. What are the chances that it really doesn't add anything to the debt if they do pass this thing, Steve, in your mind? Well, it's not paid for. I mean, you're try- what they're trying to do is is put a three trillion dollar square peg in, in a one trillion dollar uh, round hole. I mean, it just isn't going to fit. They're they're about two trillion dollars away from paying for it. But le- even if they did quote pay for it with all of these new taxes, which you, all you're doing is transferring. Three trillion dollars from the productive private sector, private workers, and private businesses that create things, and giving it to government. And is that a good idea? I mean, I like like what Jeff Bezos said the other day. He said, "Look, I, I've created hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth and and products for people, and I can invest my money a lot better than the government can." And you know what? I think he's right. See, the third quarter GDP numbers for this year were recently released. They were a big disappointment, to say the least. GDP was forecasted to grow by about 7% by the federal, uh, Philly Federal Reserve Bank, but the number wound up being 2%. I mean, first of all, how much of a blow is that? And second of all, the Biden policies uh, that you would attribute this to, what are they? So you're right. It was a big disappointment, big show, a big, big letdown. I mean, the economy is growing at six or seven percent when uh, Trump left office, and we were just really headed into this nice recovery with the with the uh, vaccine coming out. And this is a real disappointment. And we should be growing at six or seven percent. And the difference is, you know, huge in terms of how many jobs we're creating and and the income that Americans get. And you should know that that number went through the end of September. And October has been the month where we've really faced the big supply chain problems. So if anything, the economy slowed down pretty significantly even since then. We're just treading water right now. I I think we're in danger of stagflation. Stagflation is the combination of inflation and lower growth. That's what happened in the 70s under Jimmy Carter. He lost a landslide election against Ronald Reagan. If I were the Democrats, I'd be very nervous about this because I don't think there's any American who really believes that this inflation is, quote, transitory because it gets worse every week. Just just one more time, because I think it's really important. You mentioned there's the stagflation point. What would that mean for folks? And and how do we see if that's actually happening? It means you get uh, less economic growth, less output. And that means eventually fewer jobs and you pay more when you go to the grocery store and when you go to the gas pump. And so that is a, that is a real hardship on middle income and low income people. I thought Biden said that his agenda was going to help working class Americans. So far, I think a lot of working class Americans aren't real happy with the results. Steve, appreciate your expertise as always. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you.
That's all the time we have for this special edition of Hold the Line. I'd like to thank my guests, Trish Regan, Peter Navarro, Peter St. Ange, and Stephen Moore for sharing their expertise. Have a great night, and as always, shields high.